Our speaker today is Paul Spriggs from uh, Victoria, British Columbia. He's been a rock gardener for 25 years, and he's, and he's been building rock gardens for at least 20 of those years. Uh, he learned the art of crevice gardening from some of the Czech Republic masters, whom he will talk about this morning. I first met Paul in 2011 uh, at a meeting uh, in Sydney, British Columbia. It was a joint meeting between NARGS and the Victoria Island Rock and Alpine Garden Society. Paul at that time was outdoors building a um, crevice garden on a table under a tent with snow falling all around us as we watched him put together this crevice garden. Paul is the author of a co-author of a book called The Crevice Garden, which has been mentioned. We have copies here today uh, with Kent and Seth. And it was at that meeting that I also met Kent and Seth too, by the way. So I met both you guys then. Uh, Paul has received an award of merit from NARGS. He's also received a Carlton R. Worth grant shared with Kenton for distinguished writing. He's also received two Norman Sanger grants, one to help write the book and one to uh, put together a rock garden in Portland, Oregon with Kenton and Jeremy Schmidt last year. He has served as chair of the Vancouver Island Rock and Alpine Guard Society and still serves on its board. Uh, that society, by the way, predate, predates Dargs, NARGS by some 20 years or so, something like that, I guess. Uh, so it's the oldest rock garden society in North America. Uh, he's here today under the auspices of the NARGS Traveling Speakers Program, which is a program that has been funded for the past five years by an anonymous donor. So he's here today to speak with us on the topic of rock gardens of the Czech Republic. Please welcome Paul Spriggs. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bobby, for that wonderful introduction. And also thank to everyone who has given me such hospitality since I've been here. It's, it's been an incredible two days. Both, both days, my mind has been completely blown from the, the gardens and the people and the natural areas we visited. And I just thank you all for helping me kick off this tour. This is my first talk on the, on the, for the next few days. And uh, I can't thank you enough, really. Um, I also should just say hello from Jeremy Schmidt. I was talking to him yesterday. Very sad that he's, he's left the region, but he says hi to everybody. So hello from Jeremy. <laughs> All right, so let's get right into it. Um, the Czech Republic, I visited there four times now in the past decade. My first time was, I think, 2014, I believe. Um, they hold these conferences there. Uh, and as Bobby mentioned, one of my uh, mentors, was Zdenek Zvolanek, other, otherwise known as ZZ, uh, who um, taught me how to build crevice gardens. And uh, crevice gardens, of course, are all the rage now in terms of uh, rock gardening. Anyone that has a, is into rock gardening is usually delving into crevice gardens. So um, how do I forward the slides up here? I'm not sure which button. There's this clicker here. Okay. And just the arrow pointing to the right, maybe. Okay. So let's just get right onto it here. Um, so yeah, like I said, I visited four times now, um, not only uh, attending the conferences, uh, I did go one time just to take photographs for the book, uh, but every time I go, um, there's of course the gardens that we tour as part of the conferences that you are usually located close to Prague, but then I do a separate tour of my own, usually with ZZ by car, and we tour the entire country, which only takes two or three days. It's not a very big country. Um, <clears throat> but that way we get into the gardens that typically even con conference attendees don't get to see. So let's just get started here. Now, first of all, oh, right, okay, I don't really have to say much about this, but I might as well, because I need to promote it. Um, uh, the book came out just uh, in 2022, and so um, I feel like I'm kind of preaching to the converted here, <laughs> really. Um, if anyone hasn't heard about it, we wrote a book, Kent and Seth and I, uh, and it just came out uh, just a couple summers ago. So uh, we'll get that out of the way. Now, most North Americans, at least I did, um, coming from a very much an English heritage, would have thought maybe that rock gardening started in England. Uh, and English were certainly some of the major movers and shakers of the movement. Um, however, um, any country that was close to the Alps uh, at that time, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, it's a fairly new style of, rock gar of gardening, really, in the context of historical garden culture. Um, anyone that lived close to the Alps, especially the Germans, the Austrians, the Swiss, the French, they would all have uh, 
rock gardens because the mountains were right in their backyard. Here's a map of high elevation gardens, some of which actually still exist today. The Schaken Garden, the Jardin du Lautre in France. Um, these are gardens that are like satellite gardens from low, low elevation um, botanical gardens. And before Reginald Ferrer wrote the English Rock Garden in 1919, rock gardening really was the domain of institutions like universities and, um, and botanical gardens. But it wasn't until 1919 that that book kind of catapulted rock gardening into more like the public domain. Um, but as you can see here, a lot of uh, northern Italy and wherever the Alps were, were highly influential, especially the Germans around Munich. So zooming in a little bit to that area, Prague was no different. We know of, Prague, we know of the Czechs now as a real powerhouse of rock gardening, but they really always have been. You can see Prague to Munich is only about a four hour drive. Prague to Vienna is about a four hour drive. There's all kinds of nurseries. Uh, uh, Franz Sundermann is a big name in the German uh, rock garden era from Germany. <clears throat> and so all of these places were quite well connected with rock gardening. And even though Prague was a little further from the Alps, it was actually part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which of course at that time was the biggest country in all of Europe. The Czech Republic was not even a country at that time. It was, it was more of a king, there was two kingdoms of uh, Bohemia and Moravia. You can see way up at the top. But of course there was a lot of links between Vienna and Prague. And as it happens, uh, Emperor Franz Joseph of the Austro-Hungarian Empire he was a rock gardener, wouldn't you know? And he had a rock garden built at Schoenberg Palace in Vienna, which I actually visited just last year. Later, um, it was moved to uh, Belvedere Palace, in, also in Vienna, and it constitutes the oldest rock garden in Europe at this point, and it actually still exists, if you can believe that. Um, now, he had a, um, someone that worked on his, uh, on his, in his government named Arnost Silva Toruca, and Arnost was from Prague, and when he finished up with Emperor Emperor Franz Joseph, he formed his own garden at Pruhonitsi Park and Gardens, which is now a UNESCO heritage site, just on the outskirts of Prague. This was in the 1930s. And he and friends, or um, Arnold Silva Taruka, wrote books about rock gardening, about gardening in general, and had a major influence on Czech gardening culture. And to this day, you can go and visit this uh, this place. It's got an incredible rock garden that's built right into the bedrock. Um, it's just truly a magical place to visit. Um, the conferences are held just down the road from from this park. So, um, and this had a major, major impact on the Czechs. Uh, another indicator <clears throat> that they were big rock gardeners is, is if, you, if you can ever find this most charming garden book ever written, which is a 12 chapter book month by month, January to, to December, called The Gardener's Year. Well, the month of May is devoted entirely to rock gardening. And this book came out in 1929. So you can see they are not new to rock gardening by any means. And um, Karl Chepek writes in that chapter, the great pride of the gardener gives its owner the opportunity to perform hazardous mountain feats. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but the Czechs and the Americans were also quite well connected. Um, here is, I went through, when I was researching for the book, um, I read all of the quarterlies um, going back through the years, and you would be quite amazed at how many Czech writers were contributing to the quarterlies through the years. Two of these articles were actually written by my mentor, Zdenek Volanek. He must have been just a young man, because these are from the 70s, believe it or not. So there was, there was, there was a connection. Even the Nargs did a tour to the High Tatras Mountains. In fact, that's Lincoln Foster on the bottom right there in the Czech Republic. Uh, they hosted the, uh, the Args. It was Args at that time. And um, so there's always been a big connection between the Czechs and the, uh, and the Americans. Um, now, um, the, what I call the point of contact for crevice gardening in the New World or in, in North America was this this article that came out by a man named Oktar Vidra, 1986, at the legendary, uh, it was before my time, um, Alpine's 86 conference in Denver. And in this article, and he also gave a talk about it, he introduced America to crevice gardening. And he wrote, I attribute these good results to a rock gardening method that seems to be more effective, offer more possibilities, and give better results than the classical one. The method is crevice rock gardening. So you can see how new of a style this is. Now the 80s wasn't, that was, you know, it was a while ago, yes, but it's taken time for it to disseminate into our, our garden culture.
Now, these conferences, <laughs> there's a lot of jokes about the dirty room, as you can imagine. Now, this is where you wash the dirt off of your plants before you get the phyto to bring them back. Um, uh, this is my friend Yuzhi Papuchek, uh, one of the major conference organizers there. We'll be seeing his garden in a little bit. Um, the conferences, uh, they're, they're life-altering. Um, anyone that's been to the Czech Republic for one of these conferences, it usually shows in their gardens. They come home and they rip up their garden and then they build it in a different way because they are truly true artists when it comes to their gardening. So at these conferences, you get to meet all the bigwigs. They, they really are the, the, where everybody goes to learn and to connect. And um, I often wondered why I went to these conferences. And again, uh, it was just the connections that I made through, the, through going to these conferences uh, that became such an important thing. And I always say, no rock gardener can be an island. You must have mentors, you must have friends, and, um, and it's all part of a, a larger community. So um, here's just a few shots of some of the good times that we have. Um, uh, of, you know, these are longtime friends of mine. They only live 40 kilometers from me uh, just down the road here. But you do meet all the, all the kind of most important people when you, when you go to the Czech Republic. And that's really what it's all about. And of course, there's garden tours. There's demonstration gardens and excellent speakers from all over the world. They are planning another one. Uh, there, there's some whispers about another one coming up. And I would certainly uh, support anyone going to, uh, going to visit these gardens. Now, the first garden I'm going to uh, talk about is the, the club garden. So a lot of rock garden clubs in the world have kind of a public garden that, that the, maybe the group maintains. I know here in Victoria, we have one in our city park that we're just, just we maintain a small rock garden there. Well, they have one that's in a church in um, Charles Square, Central Prague, and it's behind these Baroque gates. And it's not really visible from the outside, but this is where they have their annual spring show and fall show. They have more than one show. Um, and their big plant sale and their demonstration garden. So here we go. So it's an incredible enclosed walled garden in the courtyard of a church called St. John's. And um, as you can see here, uh, there's permanent areas that don't change much. Here's a shaded crevice garden. This was built by uh, Zizi and all, all, the, all the important people, Halda, Holubech, they've all had their, their hand in this garden uh, ever since, um, probably not the 1970s, I'd say, maybe even sooner. And so here's some of the permanent displays. It's just an absolutely peaceful and, and gorgeous place in amongst the, uh, the chaos of Prague. You see there's the beautiful church in the background there. And so, um, of course, part of the conference was visiting because the conference always coincides with their spring show, which always happens in early May, kind of around May the 5th. So here's a garden that was built, I believe, by Holubech um, sometime back in the day. And uh, you can see all the troughs, and they, they just keep it immaculate, and everything's tagged and labeled for the, uh, for the, the competition. So <clears throat> what's interesting is, unlike traditional competitions where you bring a pot and you put it on a table, what they do here is there's blank spaces in the garden, and they actually bring their plants in perfect condition, like may say a fritillaria in a pot, and they dig a hole in the rock garden and they put it in the rock garden and they top dress it as if it's just always been there. Mm -hmm. And then it's judged in situ in the garden. It's a very unique way. And then the prize labels are tag are put in the garden. There are these clear plastic tags and it says first prize, second prize, third prize. So that's the way, that's the way they do it. So like this fertile area did not grow there. They, they're masters of, of making it look like it had been there, but they put it in there and they label it and it just looks like it's been there forever. And so that's the way the, the plants are judged right there. And of course they have a plant sale that you would not believe, of course. And luckily uh, as a conference members, we can get phytos um, at, from the conference so we can legally bring plants back to North America. But it's a little bit overwhelming actually um, to see what they have for sale there. And I got a little sneak peek into the the plant sale um, the day before it started. So you can see the tables are very full. And who should be there but this man, Mr. Joseph Halda. And that might be a name you recognize as really the true beginning innovator of rock gardening. Now we'll be talking to him in a little bit. Uh, that would be the second time I've, I've met Joseph Halda. Um, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more <laughs> about him in a second. But anyway, gentianas, uh, Daphnes. If you like Daphnes, boy, you know, they got every dwarf Daphne you could possibly imagine. Um, you know, saxifrages, they're huge on their saxifrages, of course. All for just, you know, things aren't that expensive in Prague compared to, compared to here. So, you know, the prices are just very, very good. Here's a selection of Carol Lang's beautiful saxifrages. We'll be seeing him in a little bit. 
Um, so, you know, the kinds of things that we just really can't get our hands on easily here in North America unless you've got some connections. So the second garden we'll look at is uh, Yirji Papuchek, the alpine parrot. I think Papuchek means parrot in Czech. Um, and so he calls himself the alpine parrot and he, he's often proud to tell us that there is an alpine parrot that exists in nature somewhere. And uh, his garden is truly, truly amazing. Um, now this is a video that I'm just gonna show you. I'm hoping it's gonna do I uh, start it by pressing the thing or is that going to go to the next slide? Okay, here we go. So um, this is the beginning of his garden. This is his new garden. Um, as you can see here, uh, the, only the tightest buns and the most well-behaved plants are allowed. Uh, things that run and creep and, and take over. There's a beautiful Acer Platinoides Maret there, the, the standard, the one that grows like a pencil. Um, his saxifrages. As we move through here, this is his Tufa house where he grows his Daphne. Uh, his Dionysias, his saxifrages. Look at these Daphnes. Of course, um, uh, we pretty much time it perfectly for Daphne bloom. And you can just imagine the scent in this house. Of course, this is all tufa that he acquired. This is Daphne Czech crystal, which we might be seeing later is one of my favorites. Um, and so uh, the Alpine house here is highly engineered, uh, climate controlled, irrigated, uh, keeps the rain off. And then as you move into the backyard, I hope you're not getting dizzy from my video here. Um, you can see, um, just, just wait for it. Of course, dwarf conifers are a huge part of Czech gardens. This is part of the, one of the garden tours, of course. Um, you might see some familiar faces there, uh, maybe. Um, and you just, just have a look at this. This garden was built by Yirji and Zdenek Zvolanek, um, who is very generous with his time in terms of helping people um, build their rock gardens. You can see Zizi's style here. Most of the rock that you see here was, was uh, taken from the ring road around Prague that they were building and they just happened to cut through some beautiful slate-like pieces. So Yirji just loaded up his trailer load after load and got that rock. There's a Haberlia rhodopensis virginalis, the rare white form. Um, and you can see it just kind of goes on and on and on. These, this garden is, these gardens are a little bit older, probably a decade old or so. Uh, many, many Daphnes, um, the Suzanne hybrids, Cheriton, Tischborn, Lawrence Croker, very, very popular, popular over there, as well as a lot of the dwarfer ones like um, Pygmaeas or um, uh, Arbusculas, um, Petreas and whatnot. And you can see here it just, uh, it's just, you could spend all day here, which I actually did do uh, after the conference. Um, he's so generous, he pulled out a bunch of Ziploc bags, labels and pens, and he said, take whatever you want. Just take, take cuttings of whatever you want, kind of thing. And so um, I'm very fortunate. Uh, Yirji has visited us uh, two, uh, at least once in Victoria. And so we've been able to host him and uh, show him around our gardens although our gardens don't quite compare to, <laughs> to theirs, but you can see. So that's the first garden. Some of my favorite plants in his gardens and some of my favorite plants in general, this is Arenaria Wallawa Mountains. It's, it's a supposedly a North American plant. The Wallawa Mountains are in Eastern Washington state. Uh, however, this plant was apparently introduced by Boyd Klein of Siskiyou uh, Rare Plant Nurseries in the 50s, but no one has ever found it in the Wallawa Mountains since. Uh, so uh, we're not sure what the story, maybe it was a tag that got mixed up because it does look remarkably similar to some other um, high alpine European Aran areas, uh, but it doesn't flower well, but it's just an incredible rock plant just in its form. Um, Polygala calciolaria Czech sky. It looks very much like another one called Lilit, which was found in an English garden. Uh, this is a very well-behaved uh, uh, polygala, unlike Camabuxus, which tends to spread through the crevices uh, way too fast, at least in my climate. Uh, but this is one of my favorites as well. It's just an incredibly beautiful blue uh, Czech sky is an, a, very much an appropriate name for it. There you can see a close-up of the flowers. Definitely a highly desirable plant that I've rarely seen in North America. Um, the Adrianthus are another genus that I absolutely love. I call them the, the classy companulas. Um, here's Adrianthus serfilifolius on the right here. Um, there's many, many, uh, serfilifolius is certainly one of the betters, um, along with uh, Adrianthus pumilio, which is probably the, the queen of the genus. And of course, the Daphnes. Um, they're very big on the dwarfs. 
uh, Daphne Neorum or Kneorum, as they say there, um, uh, they like to grow the Pygmaea forms, which really max out at about 18 inches across. Like they're just the littlest things, unlike the normal Kneorum, which, which can get up to five feet across, really. It's still a great rock garden plant, but not for the small rock garden. But these ones are perfect for the small rock garden. And if you really want a small, I would say this is close to the second smallest after Petrea, uh, is Daphne Maliana from Montenegro, from the limestone areas. Uh, this one maxes out at about six to eight inches, makes a perfect little round bun. Takes a while to get there. Um, it's kind of like a dwarf Daphne oleoides, if you know that one. Uh, beautiful white flowered and of course highly scented, like almost all the Daphnes. And one of my favorites, Daphne arbuscula, Czech crystal. Is that not one of the most beautiful names for a Daphne? It makes you want it so badly. Uh, and this is just an incredibly gorgeous one. Of course, most of the Daphnes are, are pink or rose colored. This one is a, is a white form. And here's just uh, Arenaria, I think Arenaria lithops, the little vignette of some of the tight buns and, and cushions and carpets that they like to grow in their rock gardens. Uh, now, another name that you may recognize is Wojciech Holubecz. And Wojciech was also an innovator in crevice gardening. In fact, Wojciech wrote the first book that mentioned crevice gardens. Now, unfortunately for us, it's only in Czech. Um, so it, it does, it's not much good for, for, for most of us that can't read Czech. But you can see here, 1992, Holubecz and Ota Vlasak wrote um, this book here, which I, I, I don't dare even try to pronounce, um, but this would have this would uh, constitute the first book that mentions crevice gardening. So again, very new uh, in, our, in our rock gardening culture. And so we have the great privilege to visit Wojciech's garden as well. Um, here we have his uh, essentially crevice garden in his backyard. I mean, this garden goes on and on as well. I don't believe I have a video of it, but you can see here uh, part of the garden tour beautifully laid out. This is Prunus prostrata from Crete in the, in the front here. It's a, a dwarf a cherry that tends to hug the ground. Uh, there's various forms of it. Some are much more ground hugging than even this one. Um, but you can see here the dwarf conifers. He's very big into iris. Um, and he's also a, an incredible plant explorer. He wrote, he's written the two books, uh, Plants of the Tian Shen, Plants of the Caucasus, your very famous uh, books now. Um, and you can see he's got this, his, his like, like a lot of good rock gardening builders, he's arranged the rocks uh, with a certain stratification to mimic nature. Uh, and apparently this all had to happen really quick because they rented a crane and they had limited time. So him, his, him and his son just kind of had to throw it together. Uh, but as you can see, they did an amazing job. Um, it's a very mature garden now, but you can see, unlike a lot of mature rock gardens, you can still see a lot of the rock, uh, which is a kind of nice. You know, you see a lot of rock gardens where from a distance, you don't see any rock anymore. Uh, this is just just the perfect balance between rock and plant. So you can see here, you can kind of hike up around behind. There's a nice little pond at the, in the lowland there with his wetland plant. There's Prunus prostratus again, the, the dwarf, dwarf cherry from Crete, kind of a neat thing. I've had seeds from that a few times. It's never quite, never even germinated for me, so I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. Uh, but there's just some vignettes of his garden. Uh, Aranaria stellata looks very much like that Aranaria we just looked at called Wallawa Mountains. Um, I've seen the names, I've seen stellata on Wallawa Mountains. It's, it's kind of, I think it's just a big mix up. Um, we can't grow androsatse in our gardens. I think it's just much too dry. This is a true high alpine from, well, from Europe all the way through to Central Asia. Um, but they grow them outdoors in the garden just beautifully. Don't know if you guys can grow androsatse in the garden or not, but it's a, just a gorgeous, is that a yes or no? Can you guys grow androsatse? No? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a classic a kind of European and, and Asian high um, rock garden plant. And uh, also my favorite, one of my favorite genera, <clears throat> Areogonums. Uh, this is Areogonum, probably the glassii, most likely. Um, Western North American, they call them the alpine buckwheats. Uh, There's some that, are, that get massive. I would imagine your wet winters would, would toast these pretty quick. Um, but uh, for dry gardens, this is a, a real beauty. And then this one also from uh, Western North America, from Utah, actually. If anyone happens to know where I can get my hands on this, I had to go all the way to the Czech Republic to even learn about it. Um, Hymenoxus lapidicola. Um, this is the most dwarf of all the Hymenoxus I've ever seen. It does have a, possibly a new name, um, but this is how it was labeled in Wojciech Holubecz's garden. Um, isn't that a gorgeous little thing? Um, if you know Hymenoxus, they're again also North American aster family plants. 
and just some more vignettes of his garden. Um, like I say, very, very beautiful, mature. Dwarf conifers are huge there. I'll talk about those a little bit more. It's, they're almost always witches' brooms. Anyway, um, so next is uh, Stanislav Chepichka. Um, this is one of the, another one of the garden tours, and the, he was a football player. And um, he uh, he uh, got all his tuva from the side of the highway as well when a farmer was clearing a field, and his entire rock garden is made of tufa. Uh, and the pathways are very narrow, so it's a, it's a little cumbersome to get around there with a with a tour group. But as you can see here, he's got all kind. Of, he's built. He's built them up uh, so that all the plants are very much at eye level. And uh, if you know about tufa, it's the best way to grow alpines, hands down. If you want to grow them true to character, true to form, uh, you know it's a it's a higher pH type situation, so it's it's not as good for the for the ericaceae and things like that. But uh, as far as um, as far as growing a lot of the kind of calcareous alpines, there is nothing better. Um, saxifrages, all those things, they grow absolutely amazing here. So he's created a system of, of little dead-end pathways and grottos around the place and it's all on a steeply sloping hill. So again most rock gar most of the best rock gardens are, are built on sloping sloping hills just to create that drama that you would find in, in, the, in the actual mountains. So here's uh, some, some tour uh, attendees uh, just getting their minds blown by, by what they're seeing in this garden. As you can see, he sticks to only the, the choicest and the most well-behaved things. Uh, they really tend to grow things that don't get much higher than maybe five inches or something like that. Maybe a little more if they're older, uh, but things stay very tight, very congested. Here we have a cantholemon, uh, another one of my favorite genera, uh, the prickly thrifts. And I've seen a few of them around in the gardens here um, this year, or sorry, this trip. And uh, so it's nice to see you can grow them. Whether they flower or not, uh, I think of them as a 12 month plant because they're evergreen right through the winter. Um, and then of course, when they bloom, at least in our drier summers, they bloom quite well. And you get these beautiful pink or, or pale pink flowers. And they really put on a show 12 months of the year. So here's an acanthalemon, a uh, great plant for growing that, where it can hang down. It's a plant, uh, I grow them in troughs and pots sometimes, and, they, and they can, they'll actually hang down off the, off the pot, but still retain that nice bun shape. And so it's quite, a, quite a, a winner of a plant. And it's a great plant if you don't like people petting the buns because they're very prickly. And um, I have them growing all along the front of my house, right up against the sidewalk. And people very quickly learn that they should not pet the buns as they're as they're walking past uh, and I've seen many times as I look out the window then unknowingly and they touch it and ouch the hand goes back real fast and that's the last time they touch the acanthalemon so um, <clears throat> another one that I'm Working on, I haven't quite perfected it yet, uh, Gypsophila aratioides. Um, this is a, one of the tightest buns that you will find. Um, very difficult to get it to flower. Um, uh, it's, um, it's, it's a perfect uh, plant for tufa, it loves the higher pH, um, but this is one that you will find very few plants that have a more congested and tighter form. Um, the cuttings, of course, are the most minuscule <laughs> little things you can imagine, but I'm doing my best anyway. So, um, Gypsophila aratioides. Another Aranaria um, is Aranaria tetraquetra. Another one that's a little shy to bloom, but who needs flowers when you've got a form like this? Uh, beautiful, the Aranarias or the Minuardias, um, they're quite, quite, excellent plants for these miniature gardens, uh, especially growing in tufa. They do love the, the limey conditions. Um, plant of the coffee family, Asperulas, is a, another great alpine. There's, there's a good number of them uh, out there. And this is the one that I grow along with uh, Asperula uh, Daphneola, um, uh, Asperula gusoni. Um, great plant for, for the tufa. Again, from uh, these ones, I believe they're you know, all the way from kind of Spain right through, right through Central Europe and maybe into into the Middle East a little bit. But again, a great little coffee family plant with little upturned trumpets uh, kind of thing with just, just kind of reaching up for the sky there. Now, um, those, are some of the those, those are some of the conference gardens, but then Kenton and I, and also um, others have joined forces over the, over the last three, three tours. Uh, we've joined up to travel with ZZ and other gardeners um, to travel around the country. And so um, these are the gardens that 
you don't get to see when you go to the conferences because they're just a little too far away for the buses to get to. In total, I've probably seen close to 40 gardens in the Czech Republic. And uh, some of these gardeners are some of the best rock gardeners in the world. So here's the car we always take. It's Azizi's girlfriend's car. Um, and it's, uh, it's a little, you're kind of taking your life into your own hands sometimes uh, driving the highways there, but, and I'm always the designated driver. So, um, so I, get to, I get to drive it, but it's, it's a good learning experience. It's lots of fun. Too. Um, and we usually stay either at someone's house or, or in some small chalets in the mountains or something like that. So away we go. Um, there's Kenton and, and my mentor, our mentor, mentor is Denex Volanek, um, looking around, uh, trying to figure out. We're very old school. Uh, it's, uh, well, we tried to use the GPS last time, but ZZ doesn't trust it. So, um, so we just use the old school paper map, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, we traveled all around the country. This is just, this is an older map map of um, some of the ones that uh, we did on the first tour, but I could easily fill in many more uh, gardens uh, all around the country um, since I've done two more since then. But like I said, it's a very small country. You know, it used to be Czechoslovakia, um, uh, but since the fall of the Soviet Union, of course, it's now simply just the Czech Republic. Slovakia is its own country now. So it's actually a very manageable country. And it's quite beautiful too. It's very much agricultural, but it's kind of mixed up with forests. It's got some mountains and the Tatras start to the, to the far east there. And so first one is I'm gonna, we, there's not a lot of women rock gardeners there, um, but I can tell you, Hanna Zikova, uh, who treated us royally, again, I'm the designated driver, so no, um, nothing uh, too, ha too strong for me, um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, her garden, I can tell you honestly, was one of the tidiest and most beautiful and the most incredible plant collection you could ever imagine. Uh, there's Ryan Keating on the left there. He's, uh, he's done a lot of Western North America. He just built Paniotti's new rock garden um, and Zizi and Hana. Uh, we spent a wonderful evening there. Uh, the light was just perfect for photography. And um, of course, as always, the pictures don't do it justice, but Hana is one of the best rock gardeners I have ever, ever met. She's big on uh, North American alpines and you can see here areogonums, penstemons, um, uh, asters, you know, um, companions annulas, all kinds of things here that, uh, that do very well in these Czech gardens. And um, like I say, truly, truly spectacular, not a weed to be seen. You know, all her seed pots were just perfect. Um, the lawn didn't have a weed in it, <laughs> right? Uh, everything about the place was absolutely per perfection, uh, even right down to the plant tags, which were these steel tags that were embossed with, um, you know, there, now there's a way to, if you're worried about labeling your plants, you know, um, you know something that the, that's not going to fade in the sun or anything like that uh, and not show up too much in the garden. This is a great thing. But all her plants were, were labeled with these incredible tags. And so here's just a few plants. Erigeron, uh, this is probably Erigeron chrysopsides. Um, again, uh, Western North American alpine, uh, very, very perfect, very well behaved, clumping Erigeron for the rock garden. And, uh, and that's it for Hannah, but believe me, if you ever get a chance to go there, it'll be beautiful. So, um, Carol Lang, if you haven't heard of Carol Lang, Carol Lang is the current Czech king of saxifrages. Um, we were so fortunate to visit him there in 2018 or something. He, he lives only about a half hour from Zizi. Now, Carol's got, by my count, um, in the latest edition of the Saxifrage book, uh, over 60 hybrids to his name uh, of, of saxifrages. Um, and he was so generous there. Um, you know, fortunately we have Zizi as a translator for a lot of these gardens that are a little further out of Prague. Um, but uh, we were able to communicate. Everyone's very hospitable there too. The, the tours usually start with, uh, with some food and some drink, and then we get out into the garden. But he was so generous with his, he basically said, take whatever you want, right? From cuttings, of course, and we're talking little miniature tiny things, right? And so, so imagine me just standing there looking at the, <laughs> looking at the, uh, looking at the, uh, at this. And so, so I decided I would take cuttings of plants named after people I know, <laughs> right? So I got, 
I got Saxifraga Carol. I got Saxifraga Adrian Young, who's kind of the English sax king. Uh, I got Saxifraga Joyce Carruthers, who was uh, Zizi's uh, partner and lived in Victoria and a mentor of mine. Um, and so I came, I got a few different saxes. And uh, can you imagine, it was a little bit overwhelming, right? But, uh, but he sells his saxes, again, at that plant sale you noticed, here's, here's his propagation area, his cutting area. Um, he's, got, he's, got, he's really got his systems very much down pat here. You can see his kind of triple layer cake style here. I'm not exactly sure what his magic recipe is here, um, but uh, he produces, no doubt, thousands of, of saxifrages for sale. And um, if you don't know about the Czech hybrids, it's it's interesting because um, hybridization happened originally between the, the Germans and the, and the British and, to, and the Czechs as well. Um, but when the Soviet Union fell, the Czechs were some of the first to get into places like the Caucasus, the Tian Shan, and suddenly they were able to bring all this new blood into what already existed. It was kind of like before that, everything that could be done, had been done. Um, but it was in the 90s that suddenly these new Czech hybrids started to turn up and they were bringing in like darker reds and oranges and, and tighter forms. And so uh, it was really a revolution within within the sac within these porophyllum saxifrages. So to visit um, him uh, in the kind of, where it all kind of began, was a truly, truly life-changing experience. Here we have saxifraga Adrian Young. And, you know, I mean, I'm not sure if you grow porophyllum, I think the humidity might be a little much for them here, but it's, it's really a shame if you can't, because they truly are some of the best ones. But here he is helping me out, taking some cuttings. He did the cutting, I, I was just too, <laughs> you know, you, I don't want to touch your plants, right? So he, he went around and, and took the cuttings for me. There's saxifraga Joyce Carruthers, which was a mentor of mine. She sadly passed away in a car accident um, in British Columbia while she was out botanizing a, a number of years ago. Um, uh, but I, now I do have this one in, in my in a potted collection. And then one of my favorites, this is at my house, uh, Saxifraga Sempervivum uh, from Mount Olympus in Northern Greece. Uh, this is a um, one that I guess looks a little bit like a Sempervivum, but it's got a beautiful purple flower that nods. It's quite, quite a beautiful thing. So next is Vladimir Valenta, nurseryman uh, living uh, on the, uh, you know, uh, maybe half a day's out of Prague. Uh, very interesting man. Uh, he keeps birds and dogs and he's got pretty much everything going on in his place. Um, again, he is a nurseryman. He specializes in alpines, dwarf conifers, a lot of woody material. Um, and he sells it around to, to the region all over the Czech Republic. Of course, he's got a crevice garden there. Um, this, this guy, like I said, he pretty much does everything. Uh, so here we are on our first tour. That's Vladimir and Kenton and Zdena, um, um, Zizi's partner, uh, looking through the, the rock garden, which is relatively new here. You can see it hasn't filled in. Uh, you know, he's kind of filling things in with phloxes and, and things that grow a little faster. Uh, he'll no doubt kind of uh, edit that as, as things come along. Quite often with these plants that grow so slowly, the rock garden looks like kind of a rock pile for the first couple of years, <laughs> right? Until things kind of take over and, and soften. So often we plant things that, that grow a little faster first with the idea of, of taking those out and, and get it once the choicer and slower growing things kind of start to fill in. Um, he's a big fan of Louisiopsis tweedii, which is, you know, as a, a pro point of pride for any Western North American rock garden, rock gardener. It, it grows just two and a half hours east of Seattle. So uh, it's an easy plant to go and see in the wild, which I've had the great pleasure to do. Um, and uh, this guy does nothing small. Um, this is a, just a large limestone boulder that he has featured in his garden. And, and just to make a, make a little statement, there's one plant planted in it. Uh, <clears throat> this is a Daphne Hendersoni hybrid. Um, and, and that's it, just a massive boulder, one plant just planted in a natural crevice. And it's just such a work of art in itself. Just, just an incredible thing. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> And of course, tufa walls are all the rage there. If you're running out of space, um, why not grow a tufa wall? Um, they're irrigated from above with a drip line, <clears throat> uh, sheltered from above with a little um, polyurethane top there, uh, bound on both sides by some concrete pillars, and the footprint is extremely small. Um, so this is uh, becoming quite a popular way <clears throat> to grow uh, alpines. Um, they just bolt, you can drill through this tufa very easily. It's the softest rock you can imagine. So they drill through it, bolt it to a a, 
some wooden or concrete wall in behind and uh, irrigate it. And then of course these plants love it because you've got the perfect drainage and they're just hanging off the tufa walls. Just gorgeous. Now, um, here's a little bit of a, he's, I mentioned he's a Daphne guy. So have a look at this collection of Daphnes. This is in his, um, it's a covered um, af, uh, <clears throat> alpine house, um, what the Czechs refer to as a Daphnitum. And um, <clears throat> these are all different selections, hybrids and cultivars of, of the types of things they're growing. So um, like a lot of the ones that I just mentioned, just take a look at these. Can you imagine the smell in this greenhouse at that day? You're not gonna see a collection like this almost anywhere in the world of, of these Daphnes. They're all dwarfs. Um, they're big on grafting. A lot of the Daphnes do not root as easily as, as you might hope. Some of them do without question, <clears throat> but some of them do not root so well. So they, they graft. I've taken to grafting them at home because um, like I say, you just can't root some of them, or at least I can't seem to. Uh, and so, um, like I say, they're just so big on it. So that was Vladimir Valenta. Now we're gonna move on to Miroslav Popsisil. I'm really glad I made the connection with this man. We just visited him just last year because they had a conference just last May. Um, this is the man that runs the seed exchange for the Czech club. Uh, so a good person to know. Um, if you join the Czech club, you can um, partake in their seed exchange. And, uh, and so here we are again, uh, the hospitality is, is quite high there. Um, always, always some coffee and beer and cake and whatnot um, before the garden tour begins. Um, but here's some of the plants um, that we've seen in his courtyard garden. Now in the, in the Czech Republic, a lot of the buildings have these inside courtyards that are not accessible or visible even from the street. And so he built this entire garden, and you'll see it in a video in a second. Every rock had to come through the house <laughs> because the courtyard is not, a is, not, um, is not, so here you go. This is an absolutely incredible garden. And just keep in mind that it's inaccessible from the road except for coming through the house. So all of this rock, and it's almost more of a granite type rock, um, was was brought through. Can you imagine? I mean, he he has helpers. He has a land. He's a landscaper himself. He has a landscape company, and his specialty, of course, is building rock gardens. But just have a look at this. Um, there's troughs. He's got special areas that are covered for saxifrages. Of course, they grow Daphne's outside extremely well. Uh, the dwarf conifers are a huge part of, of all Czech rock gardens. Um, I like to think of dwarf conifers as kind of the backbone of the rock garden because they. You know, they're kind of the stalwarts that don't look different throughout the whole year. You know, sure they don't bloom, but often their forms and their foliage colors can, can really add a lot to the rock garden. And so again, this is a bit of a dizzying video, um, <clears throat> but I just kind of walked around as best I could just to show you the, the cleanliness and uh, the, just the way they tend to do these things. Um, just incredible and everything's heaped up really high. They don't, they don't do flat there. They, they wanna really make their gardens look like they're, they're truly part of the mountains, right? And so um, he's done a great job here. There's Zizi and my friend from uh, one of the botanical gardens in, uh, in Germany. So we always tour with, with, with a few different people just to, just to kind of make it more fun. And then Zdenek Havlon, this is a new, a new person, a new garden for me. In fact, Zizi, this was the first time he had seen Zde, uh, Zdenek's garden. Um, this was built by Miroslav Popsisil, the last gardener we just saw. Um, and this guy grows plants to perfection as well. So here's just a number of the plants he grows. Daphne Petrea. Now Daphne Petrea is really the holy grail of all the Daphnes in Europe. Uh, it comes from the Dolomite Alps and in Northern Italy and it is the smallest of all the Daphnes. Of course, Petrea means of the rock, and it comes from Dolom Dolomitic limestone, so that's a good hint on how to grow it. Um, this is one called Flore Pleno, so it's, it's got a double flower, um, you know, very rare plant, of course, um, and this would most certainly be a selection that was, that was found in, in nature. Um, and just to show you some of the uh, rarities and, and things that he grows, here's North American Kelsia uniflora that's only native to, I believe, the Beartooth Mountains uh, in Western North America. Uh, I've not seen it face-to-face uh, -face personally, but it's high on my list. Um, gorgeous little thing. I think it's in the rose family maybe, um, but uh, here it is, uh, not blooming, but it looks like it, maybe some blooms had faded there. 
Kelsey uniflora. This guy only grows the tightest and the choicest of things. When you look at the garden, you almost have, you don't almost see the plants because they're so tiny. You got to get up close to see it's you know it's not the kind of garden you you look at from a distance necessarily. Oh, actually I shouldn't say that because it's amazing from a distance too. So here's another Campanulacea azinuma pulvinatum. Pulvinata or pulvinatum, if you're looking through the seed exchange, uh, I recently read means cushion, and it, it means a cushion for a, on a king's chair. So um, if you see the word pulvinata and anywhere, saponaria, pulvinata, lots of things that, that say that, uh, it's always good to look out for. And then of course our Western, or not just Western North American, it's circumpolar in almost all Northern hemispheric mountain ranges, Silene ocaulus, but of course not the standard pink one, the rare white form, um, which is fairly uncommon, <clears throat> certainly in cultivation and, and definitely in the mountains too, although we have found it in the Cascades of, of Washington State. And of course, one of the most sought after and dwarf diminutive um, penstemons of all time, penstemon Uinta hensis from the Uinta Mountains of Utah. Um, it doesn't really get any bigger than this. It's, you know, it's all of, you know, an inch, an inch high or something like that. You got to look real close for it. Uh, so like I say, this guy, it's, he was really a true collector of the most precious things. And of course, these new um, phlox hybrids that are uh, becoming very much more common in Europe. In fact, even um, uh, one of my friends who's a phlox expert from Germany was touring with us. He, uh, he was seeing things that he had never seen before, uh, cespitosa hybrids and deglacii de hybrids. Um, and this is one, uh, Zigunderblut, uh, which means something blood. Um, just yesterday we saw oxenblut, ox blood. Um, and so there's, there's must be this kind of blood strain that they, uh, that they're, but just, just take a look at that beautiful thing. They don't get too big. They don't, they're not like the big subulatas that can cover almost too much ground in a small rock garden, uh, but a beautiful little thing. And then one of the last gardens we're going to look at is that of Zdenek Chanchera. Um, <clears throat> this is a, built, uh, a garden that was built by Joseph Halda. In fact, they're, they're good friends. Um, and it was built in multiple stages uh, over, the, over a few years. Now, Halda is known for his great, bold, and dramatic constructions. Uh, he doesn't tend to do things small. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, and so you can see here... He's also a big guy, you know, like tradition, not traditionally, but modern crevice gardens often have this vertical or maybe an ever so slight tilt to the, to the rocks. Um, Halda very much favored almost a 45 degree angle to the rocks. You see that a lot in nature where you have a very dramatic lean or tilt to the rocks. And you can see this in his garden. This is all uh, Louisia cotyledon growing um, on the right hand side there. There's like a creek running through the middle. And this is just one of the outcrops. Um, and so there we are uh, touring around again, like often the rock is just as important as the plants in a lot of these gardens. And so they, they do take care to make sure that the, that the rocks are not covered up by the plants because the construction of the rock, they, they usually say it's a shame if you just cover up all that beautiful construction with too many rock, with too many plants. So here we are uh, touring the garden again, um, uh, azaleas, dwarf conifers, rhododendrons, and then of course the choicest of alpines. And you know, as a friend of Joseph Halda's, um, there was a, he certainly had a good selection of, of things to, uh, to work with. There's Kenton uh, having a good close look up uh, at the rocks. You pretty much had to do a bit of mountain climbing on these gardens if you wanted to get close to uh, any of the plants. But you can see there, look, just look how big and bold just the rock work is, even without the plantings, right? And these rocks are, are massive. And so, um, you know, the, there's fewer crevices to grow plants in, you know, certainly a slate or an urbanite rock garden where you've got the You've got so many planting pockets. This is a bit of a different look. You know, maybe something that, you know, less, less planting spaces, but maybe something that, that's more realistic from a natural point of view. Here you can see that 45 degree slant, right? You know, in all crevice gardens, it's important to kind of follow the rules of nature, whether they're bent or twisted or slanted or stratified or whatever. And, and you create something that you would see in nature. Uh, I'm not saying that 
it's it's a problem to get artistic. I mean, I know Kenton has built his cubic crevice gardens, and it's just a matter of choice. It's it's an art at the end of the day, and there are no wrongs or rights. As long as the plants grow well and you love it, that's all that matters. So everyone, every artist, I always say, you give 10 different people the same pile of rock, you're gonna have 10 different gardens at the end of the day. So it is art. So here's, a, I believe this is a video that shows some of the garden just in kind of real time. You can see there, you can just see their heads poking up above the mountaintop there. Um, Joseph Halda has done a lot of exploring and mountain, <laughs> mountain traveling in his time, so he certainly knows um, how to emulate what you would find in nature. Uh, but here's just one of you know, three or four massive outcroppings that you can see. Um, in, uh, this is, again, my friend from Germany. His, his name is Christoph Ruby. Uh, he's a phlox specialist. He, he works at one of the botanic gardens in uh, southern Germany. Um, quite well-known person over in Europe. And there you see Daphne growing up against some weeping, weeping uh, fur, it looks like. So you can just see that massive construction. Now I love to point out this little garden. It's built in a trough that's mostly sunken in the ground. Um, it was built again by, by Halda. And <clears throat> a lot of people feel limited when they get a pile of rocks to work with, where all the rocks are the same thickness um, and the same size, right? Um, it's easiest to build a beautiful garden when you have a great diversity of, of widths and thicknesses and sizes. But here you can see he's using roof slates, which are all the same thickness and the same size. But, and so it would be easy to create what I refer to as the loaf of bread, where you just put one next to the other, and yes, you are satisfying the requirements of the plant, but you're not giving it that undulating drama. So um, this is a crevice garden built in a trough where you can see Mr. Halda has done an excellent job of creating that drama with rocks that would be difficult to, to use the drama in. So here's, here's just a little vignette of how he would do it. Just take a look at this. The plants are just billowing out of the crevices. And as you can see, it's highly artistic, built up, right? You often see alpine troughs where the plants are flat on the ground. You should, you should have at least one third higher than the trough. You need to create a little miniature mountain in the trough. Don't be afraid to go high. If I had a nickel for every time Zizi said to me, it must be higher, um, I would be a rich man. So anyway, you can see, you don't have to be limited by your rock type as long as you get creative and you get dramatic about it, because that's what it's all about. Okay, second to last garden was Mr. Halda's garden itself. Um, he lives uh, close to the Polish border. Uh, his garden is 700 meters in elevation. Uh, he told us it's sometimes covered in snow up until April. So he can grow things up there. It's almost like a true mountain garden. <clears throat> he built his own house. Uh, it has a natural mountain stream running right past the front door with trout in it. You, there's a you cross a little bridge going over a stream that's <clears throat> originating up in the high hills. Um, and Mr. Halda has, has visited, he spent, you know, something like 15 years in, Amer in North America touring and building rock gardens and working as a landscaper. Uh, he worked for a, a company based out of Philadelphia, I believe, uh, and he toured all over North America building rock gardens and also plant hunting and, um, and uh, giving talks. He's also spent an amazing amount of time in Asia, China, the Caucasus, and he's written multiple books. Uh, he wrote um, the monograph on peonies, on gentians, on daphnes. Um, he's a, one of the best known rock gardeners of all time. And uh, we were extremely lucky to be able to go to visit his garden. So here's the entrance way. I, I think that says something like, beware of the rock or something like that. <laughs> and he probably stole it from a roadside. Um, his garden, there's the house in the background, is an absolute ocean of crevices. Uh, and he was he's still working on it. Um, uh, I don't know if he travels as much as he used to, but but there was new builds right when we got there. And so you can see there's Kenton up against the house. He is utterly obsessed with dwarf conifers and witches brooms. He's got, he told me he has over 2000 different mugo pine witches brooms, right? Now to the untrained eye, they basically all look the same, <laughs> right? Um, but, um, but some of them are so, so thick that you almost can't see um, the rocks. Um, he grows gentians extremely well in that climate. Uh, here's gentian uh, clusii with some nice white markings on the petals, not, certainly something very rare. 
There's ZZ um, admiring the new construction. That's one single boulder. You can't see the other side of it, but it's an absolutely massive rock that's almost as tall as ZZ. And uh, he's experimenting with this, uh, you know, this waterfall foam that you put uh, when, you're, when you're building waterfalls and streams. And he puts a little ledge of waterfall foam and attaches Semper Vivums to it. And then they eventually cover over. So even if there's no crevice or rock or anything, there's just enough of a, just enough of a, of a place for it to grab hold there. And you can just kind of see them all facing this, this big, huge rock here. Um, and eventually, and that's a brand new planting. So in time, they'll grow out and they'll, they'll naturalize on the rock, right? And so there he is. Um, again, we were so lucky to be able to go there. This again is the new, his new outcrop. I mean, and like I said, he doesn't do anything small, Mr. Halda. He, he only builds the biggest and the best. Um, <clears throat> a lot of their dwarf uh, witch's broom conifers are, or most of them are grafted, of course, right? So there you see along the bottom of the rock, uh, co a collection that will probably just no doubt be, be planted out elsewhere in the garden, all labeled. Um, and they're really ugly ducklings when they start out because the graft is, is this skinny little thing and the top is just a little scion. Um, but, but that's how they start. And then, you know, just give them a few years, as, as Halda said, they grow fast, which is <laughs> relative, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, anyway, um, so here's just a, a nice selection. You can see very, very Halda-esque, very bold, uh, very, very, very dramatic. And then, of course, all his mugo pines uh, sprinkled in amongst the very much natural. And this is a picture I'm very proud of. Um, he told us, you know, when I asked him who taught him how to build rock gardens, he just looked at me with a straight face and he said, God. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, and I believe it's true. So, um, I, I'm very proud of this photograph. When, when we, after we visit, we in fact spent a total of six hours in his garden. Um, the first evening we got there just before dark and we just spent the entire evening, um, drinking coffee in his living room uh, or in his kitchen. Uh, but it got dark, so we didn't see the garden. So we came back the next day and we spent a, a more than a half day in the garden, just touring around. And when we left, he said, come back anytime. So, uh, we haven't taken him up on that offer yet, but cause it's quite far away. Um, but here's a little, here's a little video of of the great garden of Joseph Halda. And I can tell you right now, this is a garden that you will likely never see with your own eyes. It's hard to get to. Um, and he doesn't really have visitors too often, uh, I've been told. Um, so there you go. Um, you can see it, like I said, it's just an absolute ocean of crevices, an ocean of rock. I think he's been there for many, many years by the looks of it. Um, again, highly artistic. Him and his wife are true artists. When you go inside his house, like it's just an art studio, basically. His wife did all the illustrations for all his books and they're just, they're works of art, the books themselves. There's more of his witch's brooms. Those are all in troughs that he hand carves himself. Uh, no hypertufa here. He, he actually saws out the troughs and I asked him, I said, God, it must take a long time to, to build those troughs. And he said, yes, sometimes all day, <laughs> right? So he works fast, but, um, but, uh, but there you go. Um, I mean, you could spend two days in this garden and still not see everything. Um, but I'm just so happy to be able to bring you into his garden through, through these photographs, um, because like I say, it's highly unlikely that I'll ever see it again in, in my lifetime. Now I saved what I might call the best for last because ZZ, Zdenek Svolanek, um, he was a student of Halda's. The first rock garden he built was in that first garden I showed you at St. John's Square in the public garden. Him and Halda in 1980 or 1981 worked together and, and ZZ was, the, was, was Halda's apprentice. Um, and ZZ, just as the stars would have it, lived in my town and was a member of our rock garden club in the 90s. And um, because he met Joyce Carruthers, who is from our town, at a rock garden conference in Portland in the 80s. They got together and ZZ left the Czech Republic and lived for more than a decade in Victoria. And of course was a member of our rock garden club there. And so when I first, within, within days of meeting him, he saw my passion and he said, I need help. I'm, I'm building a rock garden next week. Can you help me, right? I had a truck. I could source the rock, the sand, the soil. And so we built a rock garden together. And that was the beginning of many rock gardens that we built together in the region. And of course, we also gave talks, we gave demonstrations and workshops. And of course, I, I learned from literally one of the innovators because as Halda was the 45 degree guy, Zizi and Holobetch were the ones that brought them up 
to 90 degree stratification. So like the, what we call the vertical crevices. And they claim that the vertical crevices grow plants better. So, cause they give you that perfect drainage and then, and yet, you know, the plants are facing straight up to the sky and the roots can go straight down into the cracks. So here we are in Zizi's garden. The last time I, I visited him uh, after our tour. Now Zizi wrote the first English garden book on crevice gardens. I can't claim that ours is the first. Um, ours would be the first North American book, um, but he wrote this in 2006. Uh, I, can, I can be proud of that photograph on the right-hand side there, which is one of my gardens. Um, actually, that's our demonstration trough. You could hardly tell in the picture, but it's, it's in a three by, three by five trough. Um, it's, a, it's a trough we've built probably 30 times <laughs> over the last few years. And it's the one that ZZ and I used to work on. We now build it at the entrance of our spring show every year. So he was the innovator um, of the 90 degree style and, um, <clears throat> and also the author of the first crevice garden book. Um, now his garden is spectacular. It's built in a medieval quarry about 17 miles outside of Prague. Uh, in fact, the rock that was taken from that quarry was, was used to build part of the Charles Bridge, which was one of the most important uh, river crossings of the, of the main river that runs through Prague. So um, it was medieval, it was, it was monks that would quarry the, the rock there. And, um, and of course it was later abandoned, but there was no better place for a rock garden than this quarry. And and like all gardens, it has the element of surprise. When you, when you enter his front yard, you would never know that there's something so spectacular waiting for you as you climb the hill. So here is a shot of uh, one of the tours, and this is a great, air, a great plant, Aranacea amphilis. This is called the blue broom. It's a Mediterranean plant from Spain. Um, and unlike most bloom, brooms, which tend to be yellow, uh, this is a blue one. And this one also forms a bun. So it's a perfect bun-shaped plant and it's a beauty. So here we are in the upper quarry. Um, you can't have more spectacular area. You can see the it's backed by a beautiful big rock uh, face. And over the space of 40 years, he has modified it. He actually provides walking sticks to people who aren't um, steady on their feet because it's kind of like climbing the mountains to get in there. Um, and uh, and um, it's the pathways are narrow and he has not imported one single rock. Um, it's all rock that was on site um, and just there. So you can imagine uh, the creativity he had to have. So here it is as you enter the garden and when you know the, what, what these people don't know at this stage is what they're about to experience as they come up to this. I'm standing on the second level and then it goes up yet again to the main quarry um, to uh, where you really get your mind blown. And this is again, this is what, what you would Called the upper upper quarry. It's a large garden, so he can he can get away with larger alpines compared to a lot of the plants that I've been showing you, uh, dianthus, bigger daphne, some of the larger bulbs, fritillarias, asp asphodels, things like that, and of course dwarf conifers. This is an acanthalemon in the front. It's probably one of the largest of the prickly thrifts that I've ever seen. Uh, and you can see there just a beautiful backdrop and his vertical crevice style, all used from rocks taken off the property. And uh, there's his Daphne transatlantica there. Lots of the, he can grow the bigger Daphnes there too, which is, which is kind of nice. Um, things that would take over a small crevice garden. There's a Daphne Suzanne hybrid of some type, maybe Cheriton, something like this. And uh, he even has rock garden plants on the roof. Um, house leeks, as they are sometimes referred to as Semper vivums, hens and chicks. Uh, traditionally, they were, they were thought to ward off lightning strikes. And, um, and so people would actually plant them on the roofs of their houses. So here's a spot where you can see the, you, where you get up close, because the house is kind of down here. And you walk past the roof as you get to the upper garden. So there he has sax Semper vivums planted right on the roof of the garden. Um, and it's a dry garden. It's southwest fa or it's south facing. He calls it the beauty slope, actually, um, aptly named. <clears throat> and uh, so he's, he can get away with lots of good North American, Western North American dryland alpines. And I'm quite proud of this one because Mary Widow is is a mountain on Vancouver Island. Um, this is Pensman Davidsonii, which um, which is kind of our most common high alpine um, Pensman. Um, it grows only above you know six thousand feet where we're from. And uh, this one was collected by um, a botanist from my region and ZZ in the, eight, in the 90s on a mountain called Merry Widow. And so it was nice to see it growing so far away from its homeland so many years later, Penstem and David Sony. Uh, again, the Adrianthus, as I mentioned before, I'm not sure which one this is. This might be Sir Philofolius. Again, I'm not sure. Um, but again, these classy campanulas that form only the, the slowest carpets and buns and then have these beautiful 
upturned companionate blue, mostly blue, sometimes white flowers. Uh, and again, excellent for limestone areas. <clears throat> and here's a plant that I'm just dying to get my hands on. It's, it's from Crete, um, Asplenium ceterac. Um, it's, uh, it's in every garden you go to over there. And it's like, why is it not here? Uh, again, in my garden, which is verging on a Mediterranean garden, um, it should grow just perfectly. But do you think I've been able to get my hands on it? No. So it's funny, as rock gardeners, we always have these plants we dream about. And you'd think after 25 years of rock gardening, I would have everything I want, but it's not true. You know, I still don't have a good, I got a kind of a top five list of things I've sought after for years, but still don't have. Anyway, this is one of them, a splenium ceterac from Crete and probably other Mediterranean areas, grows in, a, in vertical crevices, just a gorgeous little thing. Um, so hopefully someone can send me some spores of that at some point. Uh, there's the blue broom again, Aranacea amphilis. Very well behaved plant. It, it kind of gets about 18 inches across. So it's, it's a little bigger, but, um, and mounds up. Um, but if you're taking your life into your own hands, trying to collect seed from it though, because the spikes point upwards and you have to stick your hand right down into them to get the seed pods. As a broom, it's got pods. And so it's quite the, uh, quite the dangerous thing to, uh, to get seeds from, but the seeds do germinate and uh, I've managed to get it going in my garden now. So uh, again, uh, other plants that I had mentioned, some of my favorites are the Areogonums, Western North American, uh, Areogonum umbilatum variety, Porteri, which is kind of one of the, um, umbilatum is the widest range of all the Areogonums. It comes all the way from central British Columbia, all the way down to California. Um, and this is the choice one from, from, uh, from Utah. Porteri, and, and it's got this beautiful sulfur yellow flower, and then the bun turns, turns red in the winter time. So it's another one that kind of pays the rent 12 months of the year. And then of course, again, with his dry conditions, uh, this is another one that I had to go all the way to the Czech Republic to learn about, Salvia cespitosa. And as rock gardeners, again, we should all know the word, word cespitos. Um, uh, what does it mean again? Um, you know, it's something to do with being flat and stemless or something, right? And um, <clears throat> if you're looking through the seed exchange, if you see cespitosa at the, as, a, as a specific epithet, um, it might be something you want. So anyway, this is, um, this is the dwarf salvia. Uh, it just forms a carpet, um, yet the flowers are, are normal if you want to say there's a normal salvia size, quite large, you know, kind of an inch, an inch tall. And so it's just a stunner of a plant uh, if you've got the right conditions for it. And then uh, a quick video, guided video of ZZ's. He's big on naturalized. This is Atheonema grandiflora. And when they fade, he calls this the pink time of the garden. When they fade, the Moltkia petraea take over. And that, that's the blue time the following month. And so he's big on naturalizing plants. And I'm a big fan of that too. You know, getting them to self sow around the garden so it looks like it's something that you would see in nature, right? So here we go. I'm walking up, up, up. Uh, his narrow little pathways, and you can see it's very steep. There's many places in the garden that you almost need to rappel down if you're gonna be pulling the weeds, right? Um, and so I'm moving, slowly moving up. I'm not in the upper bowl yet. I'm moving up towards it. You see lots of brooms. You can get the peonies in there, lots of peonies. Even Fritillaria imperialis is in there. And so now I'm almost in the upper bowl. Uh, lots of rock visible as well. As he says, it's a shame to, to, to cover and bury all the rock. And so now I'm in the upper bowl. And um, you can see there's his cliff that rises up behind. I mean, what a backdrop, hey? And it, it backdrops on a national park. So there's nothing behind him but pure pine forests. He goes mushroom picking back there and bird watching back there. There's Aranacea anthillus, the beautiful blue broom again. Um, and here's a good panorama. Of, of what I call the upper bowl. He also grows vegetables. He's very old school. Um, you can't see them in this video, but the periphery of the garden is all vegetables, fruits and apple trees, pear trees, plum trees, raspberries, strawberries, uh, per mostly perennial fruits um, and vegetables. And so here's, you can see a little grotto here. You can see the repetition of this atheonema, right? Um, and he curates it. He does weed them out where they're not needed. Of course, his albaricea is going crazy here and, um, and uh, Dianthus and the Sempervivums. He puts them, of course, all against the, 
all against the cliff face there. You know, no, no rock is, is left untouched. So, so there's a little tour of ZZ's garden. And I do believe this is the end. Uh, I'm not using speaker view here, so I'm, I'm never sure what slide's coming next. But I do believe, yes, this is my last slide. So this is Kent and Seth worshiping in the, at the altar of the largest acanthalemon I've ever seen uh, in ZZ's garden. And so I hope you've enjoyed this, this tour of, um, of, of these gardens that I've been so fortunate to see uh, over the years. And um, maybe... I'm going to put a little plug in uh, for the next conference. I'm not exactly sure what year it's going to be, um, but believe me, it could potentially change your life uh, going to the Czech Republic to see what they've got to offer there. So anyway, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And I don't know if anyone has any questions or not, but I'm happy to answer them. Yes. That's a good question because like all... Oh yeah, so, so the question was, what's gonna happen to these gardens? Um, like all rock garden clubs, they have their heydays. And sadly, the heyday has passed, but only just recently, right? Um, you know, there are, just like all clubs, there's not as many young people coming in, but the gardens, there's enough gardens uh, that are still young enough to create a, a good impression. But just like anything, who knows what's gonna happen? There aren't as many young people coming up, um, you know, some of them are passing away already. Zizi's not a spring chicken anymore, although he's an extremely healthy guy for, you know, he just got back from Turkey himself, actually. Um, he's been there many, many times. It's one of his kind of specialty areas, given that he's got a south-facing dry garden. Um, but yeah, what's gonna happen to these gardens? You know, like even Carol Lang, the saxifrage hybridizer has now slowed down and I don't believe he's hybridizing anymore. Um, all of the old stalwarts are, are slowing down and there are some younger ones like Yirji Papuchek, uh, the first, second garden we looked at, you know, he's just my age so he's definitely and and there's some young one younger ones but it's true that membership in the prog club which used to be a thousand members if you can imagine um is 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 diminishing right that's not to say they still aren't a powerhouse of rock gardening because they certainly are and you could see by their plant sale table there um it's still incredible so you know there's still a lot going on there um but yeah who knows what the future holds i mean all garden clubs are are dwindling that's just the nature of what's happening and we're lucky that we're still here really <laughs> right so yeah great great question um only the future will truly be able to answer that i suppose <laughs> right any other questions yes um, oh yeah so is is the cushion shape of plants the result of pruning or is it just their natural habitat 100% the latter. The reason these plants are cushion shaped is because they come from extreme environments. And so um, a mountain plant or a plant from uh, shallow mineral soils um, that's, or maybe a coast, coastal bluff or a high alpine ridge, they're so buffeted by extreme conditions, whatever that is, salt spray, you know, high winds, short growing season, you know, crazy mineral soils that are not rich in any way other than kind of minerals and, you know, nitrogen. So, so no, they are not pruned at all. Um, you know, pruning in the rock garden is, you know, uh, once someone once told me that 90% of pruning happens because you planted the wrong plant there, <laughs> right? Um, and so, and i i it's true. Tony told me they don't prune anything at, 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 at juniper level. And you can see that you plant the right plant in the right place you want it to grow to its maturity. And in the rock garden, it's no different. So no, these buns and, and things, that's their natural form. And that's the beauty of them. That's, you know, they, that's the reason they're so small is become, they come from extreme environments, right? These are not plants from lowland, deep soiled areas. These are plants from shallow soiled, extreme areas where they have, especially in the case of alpines, a very short window to flower, be pollinated, set seed, and just get all that stuff out of the wind. So so that's essentially a uh, short, well, maybe not so short answer, but no, no pruning in the rock garden. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Are there, are there conferences in English? Yes, they are. Yeah. In fact, when you go there, you think you're going to be meeting a lot of Czech people. 
It's not true. Um, the Czechs, like a lot of the Czechs don't even, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a language barrier, right? Uh, and so um, it's really kind of the younger Czechs and, and Zizi and Holubec who are kind of well-traveled, right? They've certainly been around the world and certainly been to North America a lot um, that, are, that are running the conferences. And so it's mostly people from North America and England predominantly, some Germans, uh, basically the places that, you know, there's some New Zealanders, uh, the places where you would expect to find, you know, rock garden cultures. Um, those are the people that, that come to these gardens. So, so the, the conferences are in English. So there's no worry. There's no need to, to need a translator or anything like that. And in fact, most of the speakers are, are not even from Czech. Uh, they do have Czech speakers on occasion. And, um, and when they do, uh, they're either ones that can speak English or they have a translator that are, that are translating what they're saying um, in real time. So, so yeah, no need to fear. You'll understand everything that's going on, <laughs> right? Hmm, I mean, I've always got projects on the go locally where I am, you know. Um, nothing internationally at this point. Uh, we've, certainly been, um, we've certainly been called upon to build all around places. We've built in Scotland, all through America, other parts of Canada. Um, Kenton and I sometimes, when a big project comes up, we team up and we work together on it, right? Um, at this point, you know, off the top of my head, uh, I got some local things coming up because people, everybody, of course, I've kind of saturated the market locally speaking, <laughs> right? Um, and so I got some local things. You know, a lot of what we do is it's, it's just every now and again that you build the big grand garden, right? The ones that takes, you know, weeks to build. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that's kind of few and far between. Most of the gardens I build are, you know, maybe like the size of a, of a car or something like that. You know, something that just takes a couple of days and very manageable and stuff like that. So um, I'm working on a couple of projects at home right now that uh, we're lucky at home because we had uh, Vancouver Island is very geographically diverse. All these terrains have crashed into Western North America over the millennia. And we have all these different types of rocks. We got limestone and slate and schist and phyllite and you name it, we got it. And so um, the quarry that I, I source my rock from is literally 20 minutes drive from my house just out of town. And I have a one ton truck that I just pick, uh, I can pick up a ton, ton and a half of rock, which is about what we can place in a day and each day, and I can pick for the job, right? Like when I see the site, it's not just like a lot of people in a lot of parts of the world are limited by to just getting pallets of rock and you don't really know what's in there. It's often the same thickness, the same size, you know, often it's, it's more for flagstone pathways and patios than it is for building rock gardens. So you're limited. Where I'm lucky, I can take big boulders if I want that are like two feet thick and I can take right down to the skinniest little pieces of slate. And so I look at the job and then I pick custom pick for the job. So it's a lot more work. It's a lot easier to just phone up the rock, the, the landscape yard and say, I need a two pallets of, of basalt or whatever. That's, that's easy, it shows up. You don't have to do any hard work before the job gets going. But we usually source the rock, get it on site first, take a little break, give our muscles some, some rest, and then, and then get building you know, a few days later kind of thing. So, so yeah, um, that kind of a tangent, but yeah, no major projects on the go right now, but you never know when the phone's gonna ring, <laughs> right? So, so yeah, but, and it's, I've never been without a project. There. There's always something going on, for sure. So, excellent questions. Anybody else before we wrap it up? Nothing online? Great, okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. It's been an honor and a privilege to be here, thank you.